by Charlotte Bronte. Jane Eyre had a miserable childhood. She lived with her aunt and cousins in their big country house. Her aunt, Mrs. Reed, did not like Jane and sent her away to school. Lowood school was cold and the girls did not get enough to eat. Many of the girls died of an illness which spread because of bad living conditions. But Jane worked hard and became a teacher at the school. When she was 18, she left to work for Mr. Rochester at Thornfield Hall, a great house in Yorkshire. She taught the little girl Adele. She also loved Mr. Rochester and wanted to marry him. But Jane soon realized that there was a terrible secret in Thornfield Hall. Only Mr. Rochester knew what it was, and he said nothing. Part 1 Childhood My name is Jane Eyre, and my story really begins when I was 10 years old. I was living with my aunt, Mrs. Reed, because my mother and father were both dead. Mrs. Reed was very rich, and her house was large and beautiful, but I was not happy there. My three cousins, Eliza, John, and Georgiana, were older than me. They teased me and never wanted to play with me. Sometimes they were very cruel. I was afraid of them. Most of all, I was afraid of John Reed. He liked to frighten me, and he made me very unhappy. I often hid from him in a small room. I liked to look at the pictures in the big books from the library there. I felt happy and safe in my little room that day, because I knew that John and his sisters were with their mother. But then John got bored and decided to look for me. Where is Jane Eyre? he shouted. I kept very quiet and hoped he would not find me, as he was not a clever boy. But his sister, Eliza, soon found where I was hiding. Here she is, she called, and I had to come out. John grinned unpleasantly when he saw me. What do you want? I asked him. He made me stand in front of him. He stared at me for a long time, and then suddenly he hit me. Now, go and stand by the door, he said. Now I was really frightened. I knew that John was going to hurt me. I went and stood near the door. I'll teach you to take our property, said John Reed and he picked up a large, heavy book. At first I didn't know what he was going to do. Then he lifted his arm, and I realized that he was going to throw the book at me. I tried to get out of the way, but I was too late. He threw the book straight at me, it hit me on the head, and I fell. You wicked and cruel boy, I shouted. Why do you want to hurt me? I touched my head. There was blood on it. Look what you have done, I cried. My words just made John Reed angrier. He ran across the room towards me and began to hit me again and again. I was very frightened, so I hit him back. I don't know what I did to John Reed, but it hurt him. He started to call for his mother. Mrs. Reed heard the noise and hurried into the room. She didn't seem to see the blood which ran down my face. Jane Eyre, you are a bad girl, she cried. Why are you hitting poor John, who is always so good to you? No one listened when I tried to say what John had done to me 
Mrs. Reed told two servants to take me away. Take her to the red room and lock the door, she told them. The red room was cold and dark. A servant had told me that Mrs. Reed's husband had died in the room. Nobody ever went there at night. I was very frightened. I cried for help, but nobody came. Please help me, I shouted. Don't leave me here alone. Nobody came. I cried for a long time. I was more terrified with every minute that went by. Then everything suddenly went black, and I think that I fainted. I remembered nothing after that. When I woke up, I was in my own bed. My head was hurting. The doctor was sitting beside the bed. I felt very glad that someone who was not part of the Reed family was in the room with me. What happened to me? I asked him. You are ill, Jane, the doctor answered. The servant says that you have cried a lot. Why did you cry so much? I cry because I am miserable, I replied. The doctor looked puzzled. What made her ill yesterday? he asked the servant. She fell, sir, was the reply. I could not waste this opportunity. I wanted the doctor to know the truth about my life with Mrs. Reed and my cousins. I was now down, I said. But that did not make me ill. I was shut up in a dark, cold room until after dark. The doctor sent the servant away, and then he asked me, Are you unhappy here with your aunt and cousins? Yes, I am. I told him. I'm very unhappy. The doctor looked at me kindly. I see, he said. Would you like to go away to school? Oh, yes, I think that I would, I answered. The doctor looked at me again for a long time and then went downstairs to speak to Mrs. Reed. Much later, Mrs. Reed came to see me and told me that she had decided to send me to school. A few days later, I left my aunt's house to go to school. I knew that Mrs. Reed and my cousins were glad to see me leave. They did not want me to go back for holidays. I had lived with them for as long as I could remember, but I was not really sad to leave. Perhaps I'll be happy at school, I thought. Maybe there will be someone who likes me. I could find some friends there. Part 2 Lowood School I started my journey to Lowood School in January. The weather was cold, windy and rainy, and it was dark when I arrived. Lowood School was very large but it was very different from Mrs. Reed's house. It was cold and forbidding. A teacher took me into a wide lawn room which was full of girls. There were about 80 of them. Their ages were from about 9 to 20. They all wore ugly brown dresses. It was time for supper. There was only water to drink and a small piece of bread to eat. I drank some water because I was thirsty, but I was too tired to eat anything. After supper, I went upstairs to bed with the other girls. The teacher took me into a very large room with many beds in it. All the girls slept in this one room, and there were two girls in every bed. It was very early when I woke up next morning. It was dark outside, and the big room was very cold. We had to wash ourselves in ice-cold water, and then put on our brown dresses. Then we went downstairs to the classroom for the start of the early morning lessons. Part 3 
I was very hungry, and it seemed a long time before it was time for breakfast. There was a terrible smell of burnt food. All of the girls were hungry, but the food was too badly burnt for us to eat. We all left the dining room feeling cold and miserable. Lessons began again at nine o'clock. I looked at the other girls and thought how strange they seemed in their ugly brown dresses. Some of the girls were almost young women, and the dresses looked even more odd and out of place on these big girls. I did not like the teachers. They seemed to be very strict and unfriendly. Miss Temple, the head teacher, came in to see us at twelve o'clock. Her face was very pretty, and she seemed to be kinder than the other teachers. I have something to say to you all, she said. I know that you could not eat your breakfast this morning, so I have decided that you will have bread and cheese for lunch. The other teachers looked surprised. I'll pay for this meal myself, Miss Temple told us. The girls were all delighted. After we had eaten our lunch, we went out into the garden. It was very cold, and our brown school dresses were too thin to keep us warm in the winter weather. Nearly all of the girls looked cold and unhappy. Some of them looked very ill. I walked around the garden and hoped that someone would speak to me, but no one did. One girl was reading a book, and I decided to try to be friendly with her. Is your book interesting? I asked. I like it, she replied. Does Miss Temple own the school? I asked. No, she doesn't, the girl answered. A man called Mr. Brocklehurst owns the school. He buys all our food and clothes. This girl was called Helen Burns. I liked her immediately, even though she was older than me. I knew that she would be my friend. I asked Helen a lot of questions about the school. She told me that some of the girls were ill because they did not get enough to eat, and they were always cold. Mr. Brocklehurst was not a generous man. He bought clothes for the girls which were not warm enough for the cold winter, and there was never enough food to eat. Only very strong girls could stay well when they had to live in these harsh conditions. In the spring of that year, many of the girls became ill. They had a disease which was infectious, and some of them died. Lessons stopped, and we girls who were well spent most of our time outside in the fields near the school. The weather was now warm and sunny, so it was a happy time for us. My friend, Helen Burns, was not with us. She was so ill that she had to stay in bed. Miss Temple moved Helen into her own room and one evening I went to see her. I felt great sadness when I saw how thin she was and how pale her face had become. When she spoke to me, her voice was so low that I had to lean close to her to hear what she said. Jane, she said, it's so good to see you. I want to say goodbye. Why, Helen? I asked her. Are you going away from here? Yes, I am, Jane, Helen replied. I'm going far away. I stayed with Helen through the night to comfort her, and in the morning I found that she had died. As a result of so many pupils dying at the school, there was an inquiry into the conditions which had caused the disease. When people knew about the poor food, the dirty water and light clothing which the children were given, they gave money to improve the lives of the girls.
Lowood School was a much happier and healthier place from that time on. Part 3 Thornfield Hall I stayed at this school until I was 18, and for the last two years I was a teacher. I then decided that I wanted to see more of the world, and so I advertised in a newspaper for a job. In my advertisement, I said that I was a young teacher who wanted to work as a governess to a family. I waited a long time for an answer. Then, at last, I received a letter from a lady, Mrs. Fairfax, who lived at a place called Thornfield Hall. She wanted a governess for a little girl. I packed all my things into a small bag and set out to start a new life. I was very excited when I first saw the house in which I was going to work. It was very large, but it seemed very quiet. Mrs. Fairfax was waiting for me at the door. She was an old lady with a kind face. I'm pleased to see you, Miss Eyre, said Mrs. Fax. You must be tired after such a long journey. Sit down and rest. You will meet Adele later. Is Adele my student? I asked. Yes, she is nine years old. She is a little French girl, and Mr. Rochester wants you to teach her English. Who is Mr. Rochester? I asked. Mr. Rochester owns Thornfield, she replied. I only work here. I am the housekeeper. Where is Mr. Rochester now? I asked. He is away, she said. He does not come very often to Thornfield. I never know when he will return. Next day, I met Adele. She was a very pretty little girl, and at first I talked to her in French. I began to teach her English, and I was glad that she enjoyed her lessons. I liked Adele, and I liked Mrs. Fairfax, too. I was happy at Thornfield, although it was very quiet. Sometimes I was a little bored but everyone was very kind to me. One afternoon, I walked to the village to post a letter for Mrs. Fairfax. It was winter, and the weather was very cold. There was ice on the road. As I walked back to Thornfield Hall, I heard the sound of a horse on the road behind me. I stood aside to let the horse go past. The rider did not see me. He was a stranger with dark hair. Suddenly the horse slipped and fell down on the ice. The man was lying on the road. As I ran forward to help, he struggled to get up. Are you hurt, sir? I asked. For a moment the stranger was not able to answer me. Then he looked at me in surprise. Can I do anything to help? I asked again. You can stand on one side while I catch my horse, he replied. But the horse managed to get up by itself, and I realized that it was the stranger himself who was hurt. He tried to stand up, but his injured leg was hurting too much. I helped him to get back onto his horse, and he rode away without thanking me. Who is he? I asked myself. He is not very handsome and not at all polite, but he looks interesting. I'd like to know him. When I arrived back at Thornfield, everyone was very excited and busy. I asked Mrs. Fairfax what was happening. Mr. Rochester has returned, she said. But he may go away again soon. He wants to see you and Adele, Miss Eyre. Go and put on your best dress, 
He will see you after dinner. After dinner, I took Adele to see Mr. Rochester in his room. When I entered the room, I stopped in surprise and stared at the man who was sitting in the chair. It was the man who had fallen from his horse. The interesting stranger was Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rochester decided to stay at Thornfield for a while. He was busy all day, but sometimes he talked to me in the evening. He did not smile or laugh very often, but he was an interesting man, and I was happy when I was with him. I liked my life at Thornfield Hall. One night, long after I had gone to bed, I woke up suddenly. It was very early in the morning. I thought that I heard something unusual. Everything was silent, but I listened very carefully, and I heard this sound again. Someone was moving about outside my room. Is anyone there? I called. There was no answer. I felt worried and very frightened. But the house was silent again, and after a while I tried to go back to sleep. But then I heard a laugh. It was a terrible, cruel sound, which made me quite cold with fear. There was a sound of footsteps walking away and going up the steps to the attic. I could not sleep after that. I put on my clothes and went to find Mrs. Fairfax. I heard nothing now, but suddenly I realized that I could smell smoke. It was coming from Mr. Rochester's bedroom. I ran into the room and saw that his bed was on fire. I tried to wake him, but he didn't move. I looked around the room looking for something to put out the fire. I saw a large jug of water on a small table. I picked it up and threw the water onto the burning bed. Then Mr. Rochester woke up. What's happening? he cried. Is that you, Jane? What is wrong? You must get up, Mr. Rochester, I said. Your bed was on fire, but I have put it out now. He got out of bed quickly. The water was everywhere and there was still smoke from the fire. Jane, you have saved my life, he said. What made you wake up? How did you know about the fire? I told him about the noise I had heard outside my room and the strange laugh. Mr. Rochester looked upset and angry. I must go upstairs to the attic, he told me. Stay here and wait for me. Do not leave the room. Don't tell anyone what has happened. I waited in the room for a long time. At last, Mr. Rochester came back. Go back to bed now, Jane, he said. Everything is all right. You are quite safe. Next day, I asked Mrs. Fairfax, Who lives in the attic? A woman called Grace Poole, she answered. She is one of the servants. She is a little strange. I remembered Grace Poole. She was a large, silent woman who did not speak to other servants in the house. Perhaps it was Grace Poole who wandered around the house at night and laughed outside my door. In the evening, when Adele had finished her lessons, I went to talk to Mrs. Fairfax. Mr. Rochester left the house early today, she told me. He says that he is going to stay with friends. He didn't say when he will come back. The house was very quiet while he was away. Mr. Rochester stayed with his friends for a few weeks, and I continued to teach Adele her lessons. I did not hear the strange laugh again. When I returned from a walk one day, I found that Mrs. Fairfax and the servants were very excited.
Mrs. Fairfax showed me a letter which she had received from Mr. Rochester. He's coming back tomorrow, she said. He's bringing some of his friends with him. We are going to be very busy with so many visitors in the house. Miss Blanche Ingram is coming too. She is very beautiful and very rich. Mr. Rochester and his friends arrived the next day. Mrs. Fairfax was right when she said that Miss Ingram was beautiful, but she was proud too, and didn't seem to notice me. I was too poor and unimportant. But she was very interested in Mr. Rochester. They talked a lot together and often went horse riding. I think that Mr. Rochester might marry Miss Ingram. I said to Mrs. Fairfax. Part 4 A Mysterious Visitor One evening, another visitor came to Thornfield Hall. He was a well-dressed young man with dark hair. He said that his name was Mr. Mason, and that he and Mr. Rochester were old friends. But Mr. Rochester looked alarmed when he saw him. His face turned white. Mr. Rochester and Mr. Mason talked for a long time that night. They went to bed very late. I woke up suddenly and heard a terrible scream from the room above my bedroom. Then there was a lot of noise, as if people were fighting. There was another loud scream. Help! I heard a voice shout. Rochester, come quickly, help me! I heard doors opening and the sound of someone running. I put on my clothes and opened my door. All the visitors were awake and standing outside their doors. What's happened? they cried. Is there a fire? Who screamed? Mr. Rochester came down the stairs from the attic. His friends crowded around him, asking him questions. Everything is all right, he told them. But what has happened? someone asked. One of the servants had a nightmare, that is all. She is a very nervous person. She thought that she saw a ghost, and so she screamed. There is no need to worry. Please, go back to bed now. One by one, Mr. Rochester's friends went back to their rooms. I also went back to my room. But soon afterwards, someone knocked at my door. I opened it and saw Mr. Rochester. Jane, can you come with me? he asked. I knew from his voice that something was very wrong. Yes, of course, I said. And I followed him down the corridor and up the stairs to the attic. He unlocked the door of the attic and we entered the room. Wait here, he said. I stayed outside the door of another room while he unlocked it and went inside. Then from behind this door I heard it terrible sound. It sounded like a wounded animal crying with rage. Once again I heard that cruel frightening laugh. Was Grace pulled inside that room? Mr. Rochester came out and locked the door again. Are you afraid of the sight of blood, Jane? he asked me. I don't think so, I replied. Then come into the room with me he said. I entered the room and saw that Mr. Mason was lying on a large bed. His face was pale, and his eyes were closed. His white shirt was covered in blood. Is he dead? I asked. No, Mr. Rochester replied. He isn't badly hurt, but I must go and call a doctor for him. Will you stay with him until I return? Mr. Mason moved and tried to speak. Mr. Rochester said to him, Don't try to talk, Mason. You must not speak to Jane while I'm away. 
Mr. Rochester left me alone with the injured man. He was away for a long time, and I was very frightened. Grace Poole was in the next room, and at any moment she might come in and try to hurt Mr. Mason or me. After a very long time, Mr. Rochester came back with the doctor. Mr. Rochester said to me, Thank you for your help, Jane. Mason is now going to leave Thornfield Hall. The doctor will take him away to be cared for in a safe place. I helped Mr. Rochester and the doctor to get Mr. Mason down the stairs and out of the house. Take care of him, doctor, said Mr. Rochester. Soon he will be well enough to go back to the West Indies. But before he got into the carriage, Mr. Mason said something very strange. Look after her, Rochester. Promise to look after her. Yes, said Mr. Rochester, and his face was very sad. I will always look after her. I wanted to go back to the house and to my bed, but Mr. Rochester put his hand on my arm. Don't go yet, he said. Walk with me for a while. We walked together in the garden. What a night that was, Mr. Rochester said. Were you afraid, Jane? Yes, I was, I replied. While I waited for you in the attic, I heard something in the next room. I heard a terrible laugh. Was it Grace Poole, Mr. Rochester? Will she go away now? Don't worry about Grace Poole, he said. He did not look at me as he spoke. She will not harm you. It is Mason, I fear. I will not be happy until he is back in the West Indies. But Mr. Mason is a quiet and gentle man, I said surprised. I am sure that he will do what you tell him. No, he'll not hurt me deliberately, Mr. Rochester replied. But he might say something without meaning to, which would do me great harm. I was surprised when I heard this. Then you must tell him to be careful about what he says, I said. Mr. Rochester turned to look at me, and he laughed. It is not that simple, Jane, he said. We went back into the house together. Part 5 Mr. Rochester Proposes Later that day, I received a letter, which greatly surprised me. Mrs. Reed, my aunt, was dying, and she wanted me to go and visit her. I set off at once on a long journey to her home. When I got there, I was told that my cousin John had died. My aunt was very ill. At first she could not speak to me, but one day, as I was sitting by her bed, she showed me a letter. It was from my father's brother, who lived in Madeira. This is what it said. Dear Mrs. Reed, I am looking for my brother's daughter, Jane Eyre. I am now a rich man, and I have no children of my own. I want Jane Eyre to live with me. Can you help me to find my niece? Your sincerely, John Eyre. I looked at the date on the letter. But Mrs. Reed, I said. This letter was sent three years ago. Why didn't you tell me about it before? I never liked you, Jane Eyre, my aunt replied. I wrote a letter to your uncle, and I told him that you were dead. I told him you died at Lowood School. Now go away and leave me. A few days afterwards, Mrs. Reed died. I felt sad that she had disliked me until her death, and I felt glad to leave her house and return to Thornfield Hall. 
It was summer, and the fields around Thornfield were very green and full of flowers. For me, it was the most beautiful place in the world, because it was now my home. I know that Adele will be pleased to see me, I thought. But what about Mr. Rochester? I want to see him so much. But how does he feel about me? Perhaps he is already married to Blanche Ingram. What if they are going to marry soon? What will I do? I felt unhappy when I thought about Mr. Rochester and Blanche Ingram. I can't stay here when they are married, I thought. I must leave this house, which I love, and I will never see Mr. Rochester again. When I came near the house, I saw Mr. Rochester. He was pleased to see me, and so were Mrs. Fairfax and Adele. I really felt that I had come back home. One evening, a few weeks afterwards, I went for a walk in the garden after I had finished teaching Adele. Mr. Rochester saw me there. Come and talk to me, Jane, he said. He is going to tell me that he is going to marry Blanche Ingram, I thought. Are you happy here, Jane? he asked. Yes, Mr. Rochester, I am very happy, I replied. You'll be sad to leave here, he said. I could not look at him. He is going to tell me that I must leave because he is getting married, I thought. Yes. I will be very sad to leave, I said. But you must leave, Jane, Mr. Rochester said. Must I? I asked. Will it be soon? Yes, it will be soon, he said. Is it because you are going to get married? I asked. Yes, Jane, I am going to get married. Adele must go to school, and you must find a new job. I will help you. It will be far from here, though, my little friend. Then I shall never see you again, I cried. You'll soon forget me when you are far away, he answered. But I will never forget you, I thought. You may forget me when I am not here, but I will never forget you, Mr. Rochester. I could hardly speak. Tears were in my eyes, and all that I could say was, Never. He looked at me for a long time, and then, at last, he spoke. Perhaps you don't need to go, he said. Perhaps you could stay here when I am married. I felt angry now. Did this man think I was made of stone? Did he not know how I felt? Did he even care how much his words hurt me? I could never stay, I told him. When Miss Ingram is your wife, I must go. I know that I am not rich and beautiful like her. I am poor and unimportant. But I still feel sadness. If you marry Miss Ingram, I must leave here. I was surprised when Mr. Rochester smiled. But I don't want you to go, Jane, he said. I'm not going to marry Miss Ingram. Please, stay here with me. Because it's you I want to marry. I heard what he said, but I could not believe it. You are laughing at me, I said. How can you be so cruel? I am not laughing at you, Jane, he answered. It is you I want to marry, and not Miss Ingram. Jane, will you marry me? He looked at me so tenderly that I had to believe him. Mr. Rochester really did want to marry me. He wanted me, Jane Eyre, to be his wife. Yes, I said quietly. I will marry you. We will be happy, Jane. No one is going to stop us, he told me with a strange look in his eyes.
which I did not quite understand. But I was too happy at that moment to think about it for long. It began to get dark. The weather changed, and a strong wind started to blow. Rain started to fall as we walked back to the house together. Part 6 The Wedding The wedding day was a month later. I was busy and happy as I got ready for the marriage. Two nights before the wedding, I was asleep in my room. My wedding dress was in the room with me. The night was windy and the wind made a strange noise. Suddenly I woke up. There was a light in my room. I thought at first that it was morning, but when I looked at the window, I saw that it was still dark outside. Someone was in my room. Was it Mrs. Fairfax or Grace Poole? It was a woman, but a woman I had never seen before. She was big, tall, and strong. Her black hair was long and thick. She was dressed in a long white garment. I could not see her face. She held my wedding dress and veil up in front of her. She looked at her reflection in the mirror, and it was then that I saw her face. It was the most terrible face. She had large red eyes and her skin was purple. She looked angry and dangerous. I felt great fear. Then she took my veil and tore it to pieces. She threw the pieces down on the floor and went over to look out of the window. Then she turned and started to come towards my bed. I was so frightened that I was unable to move. I couldn't even scream for help. She is going to kill me, I thought. But then the light disappeared and the room was dark once more. I woke up in the morning. The sun was shining in through the window and at once I remembered the strange woman. I thought at first that I had had a bad dream. Then I saw my ruined veil lying on the floor torn to pieces. It was true. The strange woman was real. Mr. Rochester looked very worried and was silent for a long time when I told him about the woman. But he just said, You had a bad dream, Jane. It was probably Grace Poole who tore your veil. But you dreamt that it was a stranger. I could not believe that this strange woman had been just a dream. But I said nothing. That night, the night before the wedding, I slept in Adele's room. The next day, we went to the church for the wedding. In the church, while the clergyman was speaking, someone threw open the church door and said, Stop the wedding. It cannot go on. Mr. Rochester already has a wife. He is married to my sister. All the people in the church turned to see who was speaking. It was Mr. Mason, the visitor from the West Indies with two other men. What was he talking about? How could Mr. Rochester be married? My heart turned cold. I could not believe that this was happening on my wedding day. But where is Mr. Rochester's wife? asked the clergyman. Why haven't we seen her? She lives at Thornfield Hall, Mr. Mason replied. She's alive. I saw her recently. Mr. Rochester struggled to speak. His face was white and distressed. At last he said, It is true. My wife is living at Thornfield Hall. We were married fifteen years ago in the West Indies, when we were both young 
Her name is Bertha Mason, and she is Mason's sister. Soon after we were married, she changed. She became very strange, and then she became mad and dangerous. She attacked me and anyone who came near her. Last April, she tried to kill her own brother. She has a nurse, Grace Poole, who looks after her at Thornfield. I have told no one else that she is my wife. This young woman, Jane Eyre, knows nothing about her. Mr. Rochester's face was sad. Come with me, and I will take you to see her. We were all silent as we walked from the church back to Thornfield Hall. Mr. Rochester took us up to the attic and unlocked the door. Grace Poole was there, and in the room, too, was the frightening, terrible woman that I had seen in my bedroom. She was the person who had the cruel laugh. She was the one who had set fire to Mr. Rochester's bed, who had tried to kill Mr. Mason, and who had ruined my veil. Yes, she was mad, but she was also Mr. Rochester's wife. I knew that I could not marry him. Although I felt sorry for Mr. Rochester, I knew that I must leave my home, Thornfield Hall, forever. I put a few clothes into a small bag. I took a little money and quietly left Thornfield Hall early the next morning. I told no one that I was going, and no one saw me leave. Part 7 New Friends I wanted to travel as far away from Thornfield as I could, so I spent all my money on a journey which took two days and nights. I arrived at a place where there were no towns or villages. There were very few houses. I had no money, and I was cold, tired, and hungry. It was dark now, and I could see a light in the window of a house. I looked through the window. There were two young women in the room. I thought that they looked kind, so I knocked on the door. It was opened by a servant. Who are you? she asked. What do you want? I am alone in the world, and I have no money or food, I told her. I am tired and hungry. Please, can you help me? The servant stared at me. She did not look very friendly. I'll give you some bread, she said. But then you must go. You can't stay here. She came back and gave me the bread and said, Now go away. But I was too tired to move. I sat down outside the door of the house. There is no one to help me, I said. I will die here. I didn't know that someone was watching and listening to me. You are not going to die, a voice said. A tall, handsome young man was looking down at me. Who are you? He knocked on the door and the servant opened it again. Who is this young woman, Hannah? he asked. I don't know, sir, the servant replied. I gave her some bread and told her to go away. She can't go away, Hannah, the young man said. She is too ill. We must take you inside and help her. They took me into the house, where it was warm and comfortable. The two young women asked me my name. I'm Jane Elliot, I told them. I didn't want to tell them my real name in case Mr. Rochester tried to find me. I wanted to start a new life. My kind new friends took me upstairs to a bedroom 
where I slept for a very long time. When I woke up, I felt much better. I was soon well enough to talk to the people who had been so kind to me. The names of the two young women were Diana and Mary Rivers. The young man was their brother, and his name was St. John Rivers. He was a clergyman. He had fair hair and blue eyes, and was very good-looking. But his face was always serious, and he did not often laugh or smile. He planned to go to India to work. Diana and Mary were much friendlier than their brother, but I didn't want to tell them about Mr. Rochester. I have no family of my own, I said. My parents are dead. I went to Lowood School, and after I left, I went to work as a governess. I had to leave suddenly, but I have done nothing wrong. Please believe me. Don't worry, Jane. We believe you, said Diana. Don't talk any more now. You are tired. You will want to find some work, said St. John. Yes, and as soon as possible, I replied. Good, he said. Then I will help you. Diana and Mary went back to work at their teaching jobs in the south of England soon afterwards. St. John asked me to teach the children who lived near his church. The school was very small, and the children were very poor, but I enjoyed my work. I lived in a small cottage near the school. I did not have much money, and I saw very few people, but St. John often came to see me and gave me books to read. My life was very quiet, but I was happy, except for when I thought about Mr. Rochester. I knew that I would always love him. Part 8 Jane Makes a Choice One evening, St. John came to my house to see me when I was just finishing painting a picture. He looked closely at some of my other pictures. Then he tore a piece of paper off the bottom of one of the pictures and put it in his pocket. I waited for him to say something, but he remained silent. How strange he is, I thought. Even though it snowed next day and the weather was very cold, St. John came to see me again. I was very surprised to see him. Why are you here? I asked him. Has something bad happened? Are your sisters all right? Don't worry, he said. Diana and Mary are both well. St. John sat down beside the fire and said nothing for a long time. I wondered what had made him come to see me on such a cold, dark night? At last he spoke. Jane, I know your story, he told me. I know about your parents and Mrs. Reed. I know about your time at Lowood and about Mr. Rochester. I also know about Mr. Rochester's wife. I know why you came here with no money. Mr. Rochester must be a very bad man, he said. No, no, I cried. He isn't bad. I have had a letter from a man in London called Mr. Briggs, who is looking for someone called Jane Eyre, St. John said. You say that your name is Jane Elliot, but I know that you are Jane Eyre. Look. He showed me the piece of paper from the bottom of my paintings. My real name, Jane Eyre, was on it. Does Mr. Briggs know anything about Mr. Rochester? I asked. Does he know how Mr. Rochester is? I could only think about Mr. Rochester, because I still loved him. Mr. Briggs said nothing about Mr. Rochester, said St. John.
His letter was about your uncle, Mr. Eyre of Madeira. Mr. Eyre is dead. He left you all his money. You are very rich, Jane. I was so surprised that I was unable to speak for a long time. I did not feel excited or happy. Instead, I wondered what it would mean to be rich. I don't understand, I said when I was able to speak again. Why did Mr. Briggs write to you? Because, said St. John, Mr. Eyre of Madeira was my mother's brother, which means that he's also our uncle. Then you and your sisters are my cousins, I said, feeling happy now. We can share the money between the four of us. Diana and Mary can come home, and we can all live together. It was good to have money after being poor for all of my life. But it was even better to know that I had three cousins. Diana and Mary came home just before Christmas. I worked happily to make their old house comfortable. I know that Diana and Mary will like it, I thought. But what will St. John think? He is such a strange man. He's hard and cold, like a stone. Even though he is pleased to see his sisters, he doesn't look really happy. I soon realized that St. John was not content with just having money. He still wanted to go to India. I was happy living with Diane and Mary, but I still thought about Mr. Rochester every day. Was he still at Thornfield? Was he happy? I had to know, so I wrote to the lawyer, Mr. Briggs. Mr. Briggs replied that he knew nothing about Mr. Rochester. I wrote to Mrs. Fairfax at Thornfield Hall, but there was no reply. When a letter came for me at last, it was from Mr. Briggs about the money. I was so disappointed that I started to cry. St. John came into the room while I was crying. Jane, come for a walk with me, he said. I want to talk to you. We walked together beside the river. St. John was very quiet at first. But then he turned and said to me, Jane, I'm going to India soon, and I want you to come with me. I was very surprised by what he said. Why did he want me to go to India with him? How could I help him? I was not strong like he was. I don't think I would be a very good helper for you, St. John, I began to say. No, not as a helper. I want you to be my wife. If we get married, we can work together in India. There are many poor people there who need our help. It was hard to believe what St. John was saying to me. I felt sure that he did not love me. I knew that I did not love him, and that I could not marry him. I still loved Mr. Rochester. I can't work in India. I don't know how to help the poor people there. I am not like you, St. John. That doesn't matter. St. John replied. I shall tell you what to do. You will soon learn. I saw how hard you worked in the village school. I know that you will work hard in India, too. I said nothing while I thought about what St. John had said. He was my cousin, and he needed my help. He was going to do good and useful work in India. Maybe I should do as he asked? If I help you, then I must be free, I said. You are like a brother to me. I can't marry you. St. John's face looked like stone. No, Jane, you must be my wife, he said. I don't want a sister. I don't want you to marry another man. I want us to stay together and work together until we die. 
I turned away from St. John, so that he could not see how upset I was. I remembered my love for Mr. Rochester. He had always been so kind and gentle when he spoke to me. St. John spoke coldly to me, and I knew that he did not love me at all. He was a good man, but I knew that I would never love him. What could I say to him? I am going away for two weeks to visit friends, said St. John. When I return, I will want to know your answer. I hope that you will agree to marry me. It is the right thing for you to do, Jane. You can't stay here forever doing nothing. I saw Diana when I went back to the house. When she saw my unhappy face, she asked, What is wrong, Jane? You look so pale and upset. What has happened to you? St. John has asked me to marry him, I said miserably. That is wonderful, Diana cried. If you marry him, he will stay here in England with us, instead of going to India. No, I said. He wants me to go to India with him. Diana looked surprised. But you can't go to India, she said. You're not strong enough. I won't go because I can't marry him, I told her. I'm afraid that he is angry with me, Diana. I know that he is a good man, but I don't think that he understands how ordinary people feel. Yes, Diana said seriously. My brother is a very good man, but sometimes he appears to be hard and cold. I lay awake in my bed that night, and I thought about St. John. I could not decide what I should do. I knew that I did not love him, and I was sure that he did not love me. But maybe I should go to India. The night was very quiet. I could hear nothing in the darkness. Suddenly, I thought that I heard a voice. Jane, it called. Jane, Jane. It was Mr. Rochester's voice. I'm here, Mr. Rochester, I cried. Where are you? What is wrong? Was I dreaming? Perhaps, but it didn't matter. Somehow I knew that Mr. Rochester needed me. I must go to him at once, I thought. The next day, I left once more for Thornfield Hall. It was a long journey, and I decided to walk for the last two miles to the house. Part 9 Return to Thornfield I was so excited to think that I was going to see my old home again. The trees and the road were just the same as when I left. I arrived at the house and stood and looked. I could not believe what I saw. My beautiful home was in ruins. No one could live here now. I now knew why Mrs. Fairfax never answered my letters. The walls of the house were still standing, but the roof had gone. The windows were dark and empty. The gardens were neglected. The walls of the old house were black. There was no sound except for the song of birds and the noise of the wind. Where was Mrs. Fairfax? Where was little Adele? And where, oh, where was Mr. Rochester? I hurried back to the village and asked a man to tell me what had happened. Last autumn... The house burned down in the middle of the night, he told me. How did it happen? I asked him. People say that Mr. Rochester's wife started the fire, he said. No one ever saw the lady, but they say that she was mad. They say she started the fire in the attic where she lived. Mrs. Fairfax was visiting France when it happened, 
and the little girl, Adele, was away at school. I stared at the man. I could not believe what he was telling me. Mr. Rochester didn't want to see anyone at the time, he said. It seemed he was very unhappy. He wanted to marry a young girl, but she ran away. What happened when the fire started? I asked. Mr. Rochester got all the servants out of the house, he continued. And then he went back in to save his wife. I saw her standing on the roof. She was waving her arms and shouting. Mr. Rochester tried to help her, but she would not let him. Suddenly she fell from the roof. Did she die? I asked. Yes, she died at once, he said. And Mr. Rochester was badly injured. When he came out of the house, he was blind, and he had lost one hand. I had been so afraid that the man was going to tell me that Mr. Rochester was dead. I began to hope again. He was hurt, but he was still alive. Where does Mr. Rochester live now? I asked the man. He lives near here, at a quiet little place called Ferndean, he replied. He can't travel far since he was hurt. He lives with just two servants. He never has any visitors. I went to Ferndean at once and arrived there just before dark. When I got near the house, I saw a man come out. I knew at once that it was Mr. Rochester. He looked so different from the man I had known. He was still tall, and his hair was still dark. But his face was sad. He could not walk without help. After a few minutes, he turned and went slowly back into the house. I knocked on the door, and Mary, a servant, answered it. She recognized me at once. I told her that I had heard about the fire at Thornfield Hall and about what had happened to Mr. Rochester. Go to Mr. Rochester and tell him that he has a visitor, I said to Mary. But don't tell him who it is. He won't see you, Miss Jane, she said. He has refused to see anyone since the fire. I went into the room where Mr. Rochester was sitting. Is that you, Mary? he asked. Answer me. Will you have some water? I said to him. That is Jane Eyre's voice, Mr. Rochester said. Jane, is it really you? Yes, it is really me, I said. I've come home to be with you. I'll never leave you again. Oh, Jane, why did you go? he asked. Why did you leave so suddenly? Why did you not stay and let me help you? You know why I went, I said. It was the only thing that I could do. But things have changed. I am a rich woman now. I told Mr. Rochester all about my cousins and about my new home. Then you do not need me now, he said. Will you really stay with me? There was hope in his voice. I smiled at him, although he could not see me. Of course I will, I said. But you are so young, he said. You don't want to marry me. I'm blind and I can't do anything. You must marry a young man. What is your cousin, St. John Rivers, like? Is he young or old? He is young and handsome, I answered. Do you like him? he asked. Yes, I do, I answered. He is a very good man. Does he like you? he asked. Yes, he does, I answered. 
he wants me to marry him. Will you marry him? he asked. No, I don't love him, I told him. Mr. Rochester looked happy. He held my hand, and he was silent for a long time. Then, at last, he said to me very quietly, Jane, may I ask you again now? Will you marry me? Yes, I will marry you, I said. I suddenly felt a great surge of happiness. Mr. Rochester, too, looked happier than I had ever seen him. Three days later, Mr. Rochester and I were married. Diane and Mary were delighted when I wrote to them the news. I also wrote to St. John, but he never replied. He went to India and did much good work there, but he never married. Little Adele came back to live with us when she had finished school. She is now a wonderful friend to me. Mr. Rochester and I have now been married for ten years. Two years after we were married, Mr. Rochester began to see again with one eye. He can now see me and our two children. Our story has been a strange and terrible one. We both suffered greatly before we could be together. But now, at last, we are happy.